so again, welcome uh, everybody. My name is uh, Gergely Rivoy, or yeah, short form is uh, Gerry, because that's easier to say. And I will be talking about the cross-origin resource sharing. If you, if you were here yesterday for the HTML, HTML5 talk, uh, where the legacy features and the HTML features were compared, that I will extend the cross-origin resource sharing part a little bit. So I will, I will go deep in this, uh, in this fe uh, feature. A uh, bit about myself, I, uh, I work as a penetration tester at the moment for, uh, for Siemens. And, um, but yeah, as you can see here, this talk doesn't really have anything to do with Siemens. It's just uh, things that I experienced uh, during test and uh, during my, my own time. So, first of all, I would like to suggest a game. Uh, I don't know whether it's appropriate uh, now, but I will still explain and you can choose whether to play or not, because this is a drinking game. Um, the whole point is, this, is that all the time when I say the word request, uh, you, you drink preferably an alcoholic beverage. Um, Are you the providing? <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, I, I, was, I wasn't preparing. <laughs> and I feel bad that this is the last talk because you could have played it for the whole conference. Uh, yeah, the thing is that this is a, this is a, this is a talk about HTTP, or HTML and web and things like that, so I will say request a lot, and uh, yeah, you will, you will see. Uh, so what's the talk really about? First of all, um, I will explain what courses I will call cross-origin resource sharing course because, because it's a really long stuff and I don't, I don't like long words and stuff like that, so I will just call it course. I will introduce course. I will explain how that worked uh, before. So what were the, the pre-course solutions? Then we start to dive into the security part, first by, by talking a little, bit, a little bit about the attacker. And then uh, we will see what are the problems here uh, regarding security. I will show, show some attack scenarios. And uh, to be a good cop a little bit, I will, so, uh, I will just introduce the solutions to the, to the previously discussed problems, and uh, then I will try to show you some demos. So, uh, cross-origin resource sharing. Already said that it's, uh, it's an HTML5 feature. It's, uh, it's uh, part of the XML HTTP request, so it's in JavaScript. And uh, the main point, of course, is that you can, uh, you can talk with uh, with uh, other domains. So there was, a, there was a business requirement for that. So uh, in the old times, you had your website and you had all your, all your contents on your website because, because it worked. But nowadays, uh, people like to store uh, different content in different pla places because of some reason. So for instance, you want to store all your files, your, your, your CSS and your videos on another, in a, on another server because that's uh, faster or because it's in the cloud and you get unlimited storage. Uh, sorry? Oh, sorry, I, I thought I heard something. <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, so because of unlimited storage. Um, but the point is that for some reason you want to separate your, your business logic where your application runs from actually the content uh, what, you're, what you're loading. So. Um, that's basically a, a really simple architecture. So here you have your business logic. That's, that's the place where the, the client communicates with. And on the other side, you have your, uh, you have your content, so like uh, the videos, for instance. And uh, generally, we had this same origin policy here. So, so the same origin policy uh, stopped us from, uh, from taking content from another domain. And, and that was a problem for people because they couldn't, they couldn't implement this, uh, this uh, business case, this business scenario. So, of course, when there is a business scenario, then, then uh, developers will do something uh, to, to, to implement it. So it was the case with, that, with, with this problem as well, that uh, developers found solutions to them. Um, they were mostly hacks, not security hacks, but like development hacks. Um, for instance, uh, you could have a, you could have a, a proxy uh, in your own domain that will 
request the data from the other domain and then return it to the user. Uh, I think you see that in this case, for instance, you, 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 you lose some of the, um, some of the benefits of, of having your content in another domain, like, uh, like speed, for instance. But it works. And there was also JSONP, which is the JSON with, uh, with padding. So this, is, this, this example is the JSONP here. And uh, what JSONP ex exploited is the fact that, that HTML tags were able to actually send requests to, to other domains. So you could, you could download your, uh, your, your script file, for instance, from other domains. And um, so developers started to, to use that one. For instance, here, you see this is a script tag, and uh, it goes to, goes to this URL, and they built kind of APIs using this uh, JSONP. So here you see that, that it requests some kind of users, and, and there's a number after it, and, and here is, a, here is a, a function. So what here happens is that, that this is the users, and it's requesting this user ID. So probably you will get some kind of uh, user details or user properties and something like that. And, um, this, uh, this function here, that's a callback function, because what happened is that uh, for, for this get request, you would receive this response. So here you have the, the data what you requested, so the user details rubbed around with this uh, callback function, what you defined here. Uh, the point with that is since it's rubbed in a, in a JavaScript function which exists on your site, uh, this script tag can immediately execute it. So you get the data, and then you can do whatever this function does. It, it works. That's, uh, that's obvious. It also has some limitations. But as a, so it, it solved, the, solved the original problem of not being able to go to other domains. But, but I think you can see that it's, it's, it's really kind of a hack. So it's difficult to exploit it, but still it's ugly, you know, like, like sending requests, telling what function to send back. And so it's, it's a bit weird. You can exploit it if you can do man in the middle, because then you can change this function, because you can just do whatever JavaScript you want here. But, uh, but that's only the, the man in the middle uh, case. But still, it's, it's an ugly thing. But um, then course came along. So uh, course came along to, to, to fix this problem, to to, to provide a solution for the, for the business problem and make it uh, also secure or, or uh, regulated in, in some way. So uh, what course does is um, there are lots of different uh, dif decisions to make. Uh, mostly, mostly the browser has to do the decisions. And the first thing to decide is, um, so there are two kinds of requests defined by course. Um, they are not renamed really, really well because because I'm going to call them what is the simple request, and the rest is the non, not simple request. Um, and uh, the browser will have to make this decision. So what, hap what is happening, you make a, an XML HTTP request in JavaScript, and you want, want to send it to another domain. So you, you execute the send uh, function, and then the browser has to decide first whether this is a simple request or not a simple request. So how does the browser do that? Um, it's, um, it's actually not that difficult because the simple request is, is very uh, strictly defined. That's, that's the def definition here. So the simple request can be a, a head, a get, or a post method. And uh, it, it can contain these headers. And it can be these three uh, content types. Anything which doesn't comply with these requirements is not a simple request. Request. So when you want to send your XML HTTP request, the browser will check it. If it complies with this, then it's a simple request. If not, then it's not a simple request. If it's a simple request, it's, uh, then the browser will just send it out. So then it's business as usual. So it will send the request, get back the response, and provide the response to to your uh, JavaScript code, so, so for the client, basically. If it wasn't a simple request, so for instance, it was a, it was a put request, which was not in these uh, three methods, so not in these three allowed methods. So if it's a put request, then the, the browser essentially has to ask the server 
whether these kind of request, requests are allowed or not. And, uh, and this is how, how it happens. So this question, so how the browser asks the server, is called the pre-flight pre -flight request. So the browser will send a pre-flight request to the, to the server, and uh, asking, telling the server that I have this kind of request here, so defining what, ki what kind of request is that, and then the server can decide whether such a request is allowed uh, or not. And then the server responds uh, with a pre-flight response. And uh, if the browser sees that, that those things which were asked for, so for instance, the put um, request, uh, method is allowed, then it will just send the, the, the request what you asked for uh, to the server, and then it's business as usual. If it's not allowed by the, by the server, then it's, the, the game is over, and uh, your, your requested, so your request will not be sent at all. So it will never reach the server. And uh, this pre flight request is not really complicated, actually. It's, a, it's an option request, and it has a couple of uh, specified headers. So uh, it, has to has, it has to have an origin header. The origin is the place where the JavaScript runs. So it's the domain where the JavaScript is. Um, it, ha it has some kind of uh, access control uh, request headers. And these headers will define uh, what was the request what you wanted. So if it's, if it's a put request, then, then it will say, say here put. Uh, if there is a funny header which is not defined in those four which, uh, which I showed you, then, then it will also say that, that the request contains a funny header. Um, so all those things which is, uh, which is different than a simple request will be defined here. And based on that, the server can decide uh, whether your original request will be allowed or not. And, and the server just sends a response uh, containing other access control allow headers, telling the, the browser essentially that uh, this origin is allowed. It can be. It can be more. So it can be. So origins can be listed here, and these um, these methods are allowed, and these headers are allowed, and these content types are allowed. So anything which is related to the to the request, whether they are allowed or not. So this this response goes goes back to the browser, and um, and then the browser can look at it and say that, okay, so that's cool. We wanted to send a put request put is allowed and we wanted to use this, this custom header and it's also allowed then, great, we can just send out the, the original request. So then the, the, um, the, your XML HTTP request is successful. So it will be sent and you get back the response and you can work with the response. So um, that's basically how uh, course essentially works. Um, do you have any questions to that just uh, before going forward? Sorry, what? Um, so for, in, for instance, in this case, uh, it's, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, the question was what happens if, if the request is not allowed? And um, so for instance, imagine here that we wanted to do a delete then here, here would uh, stand delete, and then you get back this response. The response will be the same, because the response is essentially saying that I allow this, and since delete will, delete will not be there, then um, the browser will kind of drop your request, so, so it will not be sent at the end of the day, so that's all. Yeah, so the question or statement actually was that, that uh, in, a, in case of a simple request, uh, the server will st still say that, that, uh, that what kind of uh, origins are allowed. And that's true. So, um, so if it's a simple request, the request will be sent and uh, the response, uh, you get the response. And I will talk about this later uh, because it's really interesting. Uh, the server sends the response and there will be this allow 
uh, access control allow origin header that will be there telli telling the browser whether which origins are allowed and then the browser still have a, a last decision to decide whether to show the response to the to the client to the JavaScript um, so that means that if at the end the browser still thinks that that this request shouldn't have been allowed then it will not show the, re the, the response content to the JavaScript uh, but I will still go into that later. Yep. Uh, how cookie handle in this scenario? Are the cookies sent to uh, I will talk about that. The, the question was how the cookies are handled. There is a, there is a, you can ask the, the, the browser to send the cookies, essentially. Well, uh, I will talk about that. Uh, so my question was taken to the pre -fight. No, there are no cookies. Uh, so in the pre fight request, there are no cookies. Uh, yeah, so attacker model, I will be quick because it's pretty general. Um, that's like the most basic web attack architecture. We have an attacker sitting somewhere. He has a malicious server. Uh, we have our target users here browsing the web, uh, probably in a, in a network of a, a company or something, and there are internal and external uh, targets what the the attacker want to reach so what do we so it's basically if you want to do like, some kind of risk assessment or something you what to think about your attacker how, how to who, how to define your attacker so uh, the first that you attribute of the attacker is uh, what kind of knowledge he has um, he can be here I call exact internal external but here I mean that uh, the, the knowledge what he has about the target services so for instance, the internal attacker could be uh, an, an ex-employee uh, who actually knows what he wants to get. So he, he knows exactly where the uh, roadmaps are or where the, uh, where the plans are, what he wants to steal in the internal network. So he has the knowledge, uh, opposed to the external attacker who, who, who doesn't really know what he wants. He wants to have access to your network, but he doesn't know what he wants to steal. He wants to go in and look around. So that's an important uh, difference because the internal attack attacker who has the knowledge, he can, he can take, it, take, take the data uh, uh, much faster. Regarding the, the goals of the attacker, of course, the first is to, to get some kind of uh, access to this, uh, to this uh, company network, to this internal network, uh, using cores in some way. And, um, Get a, attack the internal services. So what you see, what you've seen on the pictures, the, the different internal services, and essentially steal, steal data from from the user himself or from the company uh, through uh, the user. And uh, there is also a location difference uh, for the attackers. There are the internal attacker, like uh, your colleague who sits next to you, or sits the other side of the world, but also in the same network. And there are the attackers who are sitting outside in the internet and really wanting to get into your network. So that was all what I wanted to say about the attacker, because I think you already heard uh, lots of things about that. Uh, but but with, these, with these attributes, you can, uh, when you're evaluating your services or uh, then, then you can you can try to define what kind of attacker you are facing with, and and uh, how should you you protect against the, those specified attacker models? Uh, yes. So here you see two things. Um, one is why I didn't go to the photoshopping industry because I'm not really good in that, and the other is what's really the problem with uh, with course because. Uh, because it's actually a nice feature, but there is one, one uh, catch here, and it's the fact that it gives a new opportunity to get around the same origin policy. So until course, the same origin policy was, was really cool because it was really strict and, uh, and, and really stopped a lot of different uh, attacks. But, um, but course gives uh, a small chance to the attacker to to, to circumvent the same origin policy. But at this point, I would like to emphasize that course is not really a broken feature. So it's not like it's, it's a vulnerability. It's just a, it's just a tool what the, what the attackers can use sometimes. 
I will also talk about the limitations, but, uh, but it's really just a tool what, what, uh, what you can use in some cases. So I think course was really def uh, designed with uh, security in mind. So if it's configured well, then there is no problem. Uh, the problem comes when the configuration is wrong. Then the attacker may be able to uh, exploit it in some scenarios. And, uh, and I, we will talk about, not, about these scenarios. But first, um, are you generally familiar with the um, cross-site request forgery? I think so. We've heard of it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because I just wanted to recap it quickly, but then I will just really fast. So, attacker makes a malicious website with the content to post, for instance, on this server. Imagine that Facebook is here and he wants to get, uh, post uh, something on Facebook in your name. Uh, the, the, the target user browses the, the malicious website and, um, and if there is no protection, then, then this website will will send a, a request to the, to the target server to, to actually uh, execute the action what the attacker wanted, in this case, to post in your name on Facebook. That's, that's uh, basically uh, uh, the c surf attack. And uh, why I said it is because course is mostly uh, useful in, in, in cross-site request forgery attacks. So it really helps a lot if you can use uh, JavaScript because Course means essentially that you can use JavaScript in your attacks, uh, in CSERF attacks. So just a few ideas. Uh, when can you use it? Uh, for instance, multi-stage multi um, um, CSERF attacks. Uh, imagine a web shop. Uh, when you're buying something, you, you choose the product, put it in, the, put it in your uh, shopping basket, um, fill out uh, the delivery address, and uh, your credit card is already filled because you're logged in and then you click on checkout and that's it. So you need to do at least three things to, to, to do a successful uh, attack against, uh, against this web shop to buy something. So it's, if you cannot use JavaScript then, then it will be pretty difficult because, because you have to re hardly social engineer the, the user to do so many things for you. To so like do actions for you because you need to do three actions at least. But uh, with course, you can exploit JavaScript in this case. So you can use JavaScript to do all these things. And, and since it's a web shop, you can, you can really uh, prepare your attack. So it's, it's, you can go there, look at it, how to do that, prepare your JavaScript, and, and then when the user goes there, it just happens. So that's how, that's how you can exploit it. And um, a second case, is uh, the cross-domain data theft that's like really basic um, uh, that you, you go in through the user, you go into the network, take out some data and send it back to you. Because you can use JavaScript, that's again uh, really simple. You download the data and send it outside somehow. Uh, for instance, if you know the, the, the Beef uh, framework, so the, the browser exploitation framework, um, they also use uh, course, um, when they exploit some other server and they communicate with this server, uh, they, they exploit the fact that they can do that because of course. Uh, you can, there are already some tools on the internet uh, which you can use to do network enumeration uh, based on course. Uh, it's not really, so it's a kind of end map, but it's, it's, it's not like that. So it's, it's mostly heuristics to decide which service is up and which is not. It's based on timing and, and uh, things like that. But still, cores still allow you to, to send requests to different servers and uh, to, see, uh, to see what they are responding. And based on that, do some kind of enum enumeration for you. So that was also another example. And the last thing, I have a very sophisticated slide for that, uh, is the file upload uh, CSERF. I was, uh, I was doing a, a pen test of um, a very simple application, which was actually um, a login page and a file upload page. That was all, so that was the whole application. So obviously I wanted to do some malicious file upload. And I tried that, so I tried to, um, I tried to craft uh, 
a, an HTML form to, to create a file upload request. So when you use the, when you use the file upload uh, form of, um, of uh, HTML, then it will send a multi-type uh, request to the server, a multi-type POST request. So I tried to mimic the same with a, with a normal form. So not a file upload form, but a normal form. And it turns out that, uh, that I, I, ca I couldn't do that. Um, maybe I, I, I didn't do well, so if you can do that, ju just let me know. <laughs> uh, but the thing is that, that the file upload form, if you use the file upload form, it will put here this, this file name attribute. And you cannot really do that with a normal form because you don't have so, many, so much uh, influence on the, on the content of a, of a form which, which creates a, a multi-stage request. Um, so you, you will not be able to put this attribute here. And because of that, it, or in my case, it didn't work with the server. So it didn't like my request. But using course, that's not really a problem anymore because you have JavaScript. So you can create whatever you, request you want. So uh, this, is, this is a proof of concept code for, the, for this file upload. So what you see here, this is uh, an HTML. And uh, here is the JavaScript. And, and I, essentially, I create this multi-part multi request uh, with JavaScript. And here you can see that this is where, this is where I put this, this attribute uh, line there, so this content disposition line there, which I couldn't do with the normal form. So with this JavaScript code, you can create the same, uh, exactly the same request what, um, what uh, would be generated by a file upload form, an HTML file upload form. And then, of course, because it's JavaScript, this will, this will do a submit button, but it's not necessary. So you can do it without user interaction. And um, funnily, when I was doing it, at first I implemented it myself. But I turned out that it turned out that Burp, so Portsvigger just released a new Burp version the day before implementing the same functionality. So now if you are, if you're using Burp Pro and you are, uh, you have like uh, something like this and you click on to generate proof of concept. So CSERF uh, proof of concept, then Burp will generate the same thing. So this is a Burp generated uh, proof of concept actually. So, so with Burp, it's, uh, it's pretty easy now to do such things and then you can, you can change it if you want. But the point is that, that because of course we could, we could exploit this issue, uh, what was not exploitable before course. Oh, uh, here's my favorite GIF, but yeah, LibreOffice doesn't like it. Anyway, so we have, as I said, this is not a bro broken feature. It's a, it's a, it's a well-made feature. So we have to fight, fight as a penetration tester. We have to fight with, uh, with, uh, different um, limitations. The first one uh, I like to call is the, the write-only request. And, uh, and um, that's, we, we get back to the, to the point what you asked. So in some cases, when something goes wrong, you still get back the response from the server. But based on the last de decision of the browser, the browser will not show this response to the, to the client or to the JavaScript. It's actually pretty, pretty interesting. Even if you use Firebug, you see that you got the response. You see that it's uh, 200 OK or something, or something me meaningful. You see that you get back the response. But even in Firebug, you cannot open the content. So it will be empty. And it's because of this, because the browser will not allow JavaScript to, to see the content of the response. And, uh, and this is what you see here. These are the the cases uh, where I experienced uh, such a limitation. And um, th the first one is there is no access control allow origins header in the response. That, that means that course is not enabled on the server. So the server doesn't know anything about course. Um, in, this case, in this case, the browser will say, oh, sorry, this guy doesn't know anything about course. Then I don't allow the, request, uh, th the response to be seen. That's the last, last line of defense. Um, the second is that the source origin is uh, not allowed uh, in the origin header. That's what, what you asked, that 
that uh, you send a simple request, you get back the response, uh, but, but your origin is not allowed actually. Then the browser still says that, okay, sorry, that was my fault, but you cannot get the content. And uh, the last one, it, it goes back to you with the cookies. So you can, there is this with credentials that's, uh, that's uh, part of the XML HTTP request. So you can say XML HTTP request dot with credentials is uh, uh, equals true. That means that you're telling the browser that please with, re with this request send the credentials. So the credentials are the uh, authentication headers and the cookies. So, so now you can do that. You can tell the, you can tell the uh, browser to send the credentials to the other domain uh, with, the, uh, with the request. That's also a pretty interesting thing. And this line is really important. This, this line says that if you're using with credentials and you got back the response and this uh, access control allow origin is set to all domains, so all domains is allowed, then it will not show the response to the, to the, uh, to the JavaScript. That's really important because if this, if this requirement wouldn't be there, uh, then the, the CSERF protections what we are currently using they will be they would be more or less useless uh, in this all domains settings, because what you could do is you could send a get request. So, CSERF protections I mean that using some kind of random token in the in the form. Uh, so, random token is is built in, in the HTML form, and because of that, the attacker cannot create a fake form with the with the correct token. So, but in such a case, so if if this wouldn't exist, then the attacker could send first a request for the whatever checkout page, uh, get the form with, the, with a, a correct uh, CSERF token, and from JavaScript, take the token, and with that, create a valid post request to, sub, to submit this form. So this, was, this would circumvent the, the, the currently used uh, CSERF protections. But, uh, so we are actually lucky that, that this exists. This says that if you are just sending a simple request and credentials are involved, then, then uh, all domains shouldn't be accepted. So then you wouldn't be able to, to get the tokens. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I meant here, and that's why I call it write-only request, because, because it's very important that the requests are still be sent, and it will still be executed on the server. So the, the action what you asked for will happen on the server, you just don't see the response. That's the point. So, so whatever you want it to do, uh, it will happen on the server, you don't see the response. Uh, I will speed up a bit, because of the demos. Um, yeah, the second limitations, the pre request fails. Um, actually, so in any case, when you deal with weird requests, uh, some frameworks do that, they use weird headers and things like that, then the pre request will fail, and, uh, and then there, you cannot do anything. So then your request will not be sent. It's, uh, it's so simple. Uh, yeah, here is the good cop part, uh, solutions. Uh, more awareness of, uh, of the basics, of course. That's what I'm essentially doing here uh, because I think everybody should understand it at least in, so, in, in, in such a level that, that they can implement it properly. Uh, be as strict with allow origin uh, settings as, uh, as possible. Think about whether you want to allow credentials or not. If not, then reject them all. So there is nothing really uh, complicated with that. Uh, I think it's interesting that it's a bit of a change of a mindset. So, so these settings are, um, are both on, on the, on the uh, web server or web container level and also in the, on the dev development level. So, so you, can, you can either fix it on your, uh, or set it in the, in the, in the web server, like, um, like with uh, HT, uh, Apache HTTPD, where you can use the mod headers and and set it for different files and different uh, directories. Uh, in this way, just simply setting the header. 
or you can do it in your application code itself. So like, like with uh, ASP.NET, simply if, if some kind of resource was requested where course should be enabled, then set the header in the application itself. Uh, yeah, uh, so demo time. Uh, I didn't want to sacrifice any cats and sheep for the gods of demo, so uh, so I recorded demo. So I, I didn't want to try. It. Were you eating a hamburger when you made these slides? <laughs> Why? <laughs> no, I'm vegetarian. No. <laughs> uh, Uh, yeah, so this one is the this one is the the sugar CRM. It's a it's a CRM application. Uh, you can try it on the web as I did. Uh, what I want to do here, or actually, it's Jane. We see here Jane. Uh, Jane is a regular user in the application, and um, but she doesn't like it, so she wants to be she wants to be an administrator. And um, here in the other browser, this is the, this is the administrator. Uh, he or she, I don't know, uh, is also looking at Jane's profile, uh, saying that uh, Jane is a, a regular user. So there is this weird cookie. It's actually I didn't know that time. It's, uh, it's it comes from Amazon, so it's a load balancing cookie or whatever. I don't know exactly, but but it's um, it's uh, the weird thing is that it's it's only uh, valid for 60 seconds. Uh, when I tried to use CSurf in this case, the only thing what stopped me was this cookie because because uh, it's valid for 60 seconds. You can send a request after that, and you get back the same, exactly the same cookie. But that means, as an attacker, that you have 60 seconds to to send your malicious request after the last refresh of the of the application, which is which is not too much. Uh, but but course is going to help. Uh, Yeah, sorry, the back, black background doesn't work really well. So this is the this is the uh, proof of concept uh, attack. The the long long part is the request to uh, to change the to change the user settings. That's why it's so long. And uh, in the beginning, you see that I send just a get request to the server. This is only to get uh, a valid cookie for 60 seconds. That what that's the whole point. To send a GET request and with the response get back a new cookie, so that when I send actually the the user the change request, then it will it will contain this this uh, this cookie, and because of that the request will be accepted. And uh, yeah, there is an is admin uh, parameter, and if it's one, then you're going to be an ad admin. So let's see. Uh, yeah, user has clicked on something. And in Firebug, you will see the request uh, going. First, the get request to get the cookie. And I think it was uh, three seconds. And then the request to change the, the user attributes. So uh, I will show that shortly in Burp. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you, here you see that in this get request, we didn't have the cookie. Then we, had, we got back the cookie in the, in the set cookie header. And this made our next request, the post request, uh, uh, valid. So you see that in the post request, we, still, we, we have every uh, cookies which are needed for the application. And also is admin set to, set to one. And the response is a redirect, which was the, which was the normal response for such request in this application. So if we go back to the to the uh, service and refresh our our page, I just click on edit to refresh it. I see I click on it. Yeah, cool. And uh, ta-da, uh, Jade is now a system administrator. And then I go back to I go back to the other browser that's that's Jane's browser. And refresh it again, so Jane also sees that uh, that um, that uh, uh, that she's now an admin. Uh, I was 
I was cheating in this case a little bit. Uh, have some, has somebody noticed it? What was the cheat? Because I talked about this with, uh, with uh, the, the, the sugar serum guys, and they told me that it, it only worked because I used localhost, so that my malicious file was running on localhost, and that's the only reason. And, uh, and they, are, they, they, they are right, actually. Um, and this also shows that, that even if you play with it, it's, it, there are always surprises with cores, because it only worked because, uh, because it was a local host, and if you're running a local host, then the, the, the uh, access um, control allo origin header will not, will not be uh, filled properly. And that's the only reason why it worked with the server. It wouldn't work uh, from a normal domain. Uh, yeah. And that's the other example. This is a wiki because, because there are wikis everywhere. Uh, I think everybody, every company has a wiki. And I also have a wiki and I, stole, I, I, st um, I keep my, my secret plans there. How am I going to take over the world? And uh, the attacker wants to steal my, my secret plans. Um, the, the wiki actually it's, it's configured so it's configured to allow all domains and in this case I the attacker exploits this this fact that I configured it wrong um, so what we want to do is to create a website which will take this wiki and send out back to the attacker and uh, this is how how it's uh, happening uh, I'm, I don't know whether you see see it actually so this is a um, an HTML page with JavaScript with two parts. The first part will, uh, will request the, the URL uh, from the wiki. Since it's a wiki, it doesn't ask for authentication to read the page. It only asks for authentication to, to edit it. So we don't need cookies to, to read the content. And the second part, when, when we receive the content, the second part will, will send it to, 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 to the website of the attacker, to this writer PHP, which is like, never use this PHP code. It's like vulnerable to everything, probably. Uh, but what it does, it receives some content and it will write it on the disk uh, uh, to save it later. That will be the incoming.html. So let's see. So the case is the same. The, the user has to browse the, the page of the attacker. and. Uh, it's an innocent page uh, with ponies, but if you scroll on the scroll on the image, then something is going to happen. Oh yeah. And at the bottom, you see that there were two requests sent. Uh, uh, yeah, we will go to Burp to see these two requests. The first request is uh, we go to the to the wiki and get the super secret plan. You see, uh, there, it's allowed for, for every origin. That's why we, actually, we can read it from the, uh, from the uh, response. And it works because it was, uh, it was not with credential. That's why you can read it from JavaScript. And then the second request just sends it back to the, back to the attacker, uh, which was successful. So if we now try to load the uh, incoming HTML on the attacker's page. Then, yes, we stole the super, super secret plan. So what's the, what's the takeaway here is that using course, we were able to smuggle out data from the internal network. And I think with that, I will finish this off. So, um, are there any questions? <laughs> All right, then, thank you very much.